APCO Basic Science Video Topic, Malarian Anomalies Malarian anomalies are the incomplete or abnormal formation and or fusion of the malarian or paramesonephric ducts. Congenital anomalies of the uterus affect 2-4% of women with normal reproductive outcomes. For women with adverse reproductive outcomes, malarian anomalies occur at greater prevalence, from 5-25% to of women. The true incidence can be difficult to determine since many women with uterine anomalies are often asymptomatic and as a result go unrecognized. They have a wide range of impact on women and can affect a woman's obstetrical outcomes. The objectives of this video are Describe the embryologic origins of the reproductive tract Identify genes and hormones involved in sexual differentiation And to understand the pathophysiology of malarian anomalies Let's meet our patient she is a 34-year-old Gravida 1 at 35 weeks gestational age who presents in active labor. Her pregnancy has been uncomplicated. She is 5 centimeters dilated and the fetus is known to be in the frank breech presentation. You counsel her that since she is in preterm labor and since the baby is breech, you recommend a cesarean section. After discussing the risks and benefits, she consents to the surgery. In the operating room, the fetus is mostly on the maternal right. When you explore the uterus, you feel an indentation in the upper cavity consistent with two uterine horns. This is most consistent with the bicorneate uterus. What causes a bicorneate uterus? To understand the pathophysiology, it is important to remember the embryologic origins of the reproductive system. The embryonic disc transforms into ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm during the third week. Between the third and fifth week, development of the urogenital tract begins as intermediate mesoderm on either side of the fetus. The intermediate mesoderm gives rise to the urogenital ridge. The urogenital ridge is further divided into the genital ridge, which ultimately gives rise to the ovary or testes, the nephrogenic cord, which gives rise to the kidneys, and the paramesonephric or malarian ducts, and the mesonephric or wolfian ducts. Labeled in this image are the gonads, the paramesonephric ducts, and the mesonephric ducts. The ducts contact the urogenital sinus, which gives rise to the bladder urethra and distal vagina. The paramesonephric or malarian ducts give rise to the fallopian tubes, uterus, and the upper two-thirds of the vagina. The mesonephric or wolfian ducts give rise to the ureters, which are not demonstrated in this image, as well as the male genital ducts, including the epididymis and vas deferens and seminal vesicles. Let's look at them side by side. The malarian duct structures are shown on the left, and the ovary comes from the genital ridge as an undifferentiated gonad. The Wolfian duct structures are seen on the right, as well as the testes, which again is from the genital ridge. From here, let's take a closer look at how sexual differentiation occurs. On the short arm of the Y chromosome lies the SRY gene, located in the sex-determining region of the Y chromosome. The SRY gene encodes for SRY protein, previously known as testes determining factor, or TDF. The SRY protein leads to gonadal differentiation of the testes and produces antimalarian hormone and testosterone. Antimalarian hormone causes regression of the paramesonephric ducts, and testosterone drives the persistence and differentiation of the mesonephric ducts. Let's pause, read, and apply. How does female sexual differentiation occur? There is no Y chromosome and therefore no SRY protein. Let's take a closer look to see what happens from there. If there is no Y chromosome, there is no production of SRY protein, and therefore no production of testosterone and antimalarian hormone. This leads to regression of the mesonephric ducts and persistence of the paramesonephric ducts. The paramesonephric ducts extend downward immediately to fuse in the midline. The uterus is formed by this fusion at around the 10th week. The septum is reabsorbed, creating the uterine cavity, which is completed at around 20 weeks. Errors can occur with both fusion and resorption. At the distal end, the fused ducts contact the urogenital sinus. Again, the urogenital sinus gives rise to the bladder, urethra, and distal vagina. When the fused paramesonephric ducts contact the urogenital sinus, formation of the sinovaginal bulbs is induced. The sinovaginal bulbs proliferate and form the vaginal plate. Canalization occurs to form the vaginal lumen in the second trimester. So with our patient, what caused the bicorneate uterus? There are three main types of error. The first type of error is an error in fusion. With the bicorneate uterus, there is a partial fusion of the ducts, creating an indent in the fundus. With the unicorneate uterus, there is an asymmetric lateral fusion defect. 
One cavity is usually normal, while the other duct is poorly developed. Uterine didelphus, or double uterus, is when two malarian ducts fail to fuse, causing duplication of the reproductive structures. There can also be errors in septal resorption. With the septate uterus, there is a normal external surface of the fundus, with incomplete resorption of the midline septum between the two malarian ducts. Another septal resorption defect is an arcuate uterus. There is a slight midline septum with minimal and often broad fundal cavity indentation. The last type of error is an error in organogenesis. Malarian agenesis, also known as MRKH or meyer rokitansky kusterhauser syndrome, is when all or part of the malarian tract fails to form or is underdeveloped. This typically means an absent vagina with variable uterine development. In this laparoscopy image, the white arrows are pointing at bilateral uterine remnants. Let's take a look at a few of these side by side. Bicornuate, septate, and arcuate uterine anomalies can be difficult to differentiate. With bicornuate uteri, there is a cleft in the outer contour of the fundus. The septate uterus has a normal outer contour, and the septum is usually fibrous but can have muscular components. In an arcuate uterus, there is also a normal outer contour. There is a mild indent of the endometrium at the uterine fundus. Let's take a moment to review errors that can affect the vagina. They can be present with uterine anomalies, and remember that the paramesonephric ducts account for the upper two-thirds of the vagina. Transverse vaginal septa are believed to arise from failed malarian duct fusion or failed canalization of the vaginal plate. They can develop at any level of the vagina. Another vaginal defect is a longitudinal vaginal septum. This results from defective lateral fusion or incomplete reabsorption of the caudal portion of the malarian ducts. These can be partial or extend the complete length of the vagina and can often be seen with uterine didelphus, as seen in this drawing. Let's pause, read, and apply. How do malarian anomalies affect breast development? It is important to remember that the ovaries are derived separately so that women with malarian anomalies typically have functionally normal ovaries and are phenotypic females with normal breast development. Alternatively, the renal system forms closely with the paramesonephric ducts, and as a result, renal anomalies are found in 20-30% to 30 of women with malarian defects. Once a malarian anomaly is confirmed, women must be evaluated for renal anomalies. Renal anomalies can be diagnosed with MRI, ultrasound, or intravenous pilogram. Like our patient, many women are asymptomatic. Symptoms can vary greatly depending on the defect. Some women will present with pelvic pain, either cyclic or non-cyclic, and can develop endometriosis if there is a non-communicating functioning horn, which can see the peritoneum through retromenstruation. Women can present with menstrual abnormalities, including minimal bleeding or amenorrhea with agenesis. There are also many obstetrical complications associated with malarian anomalies. Let's review the etiology. Recurrent pregnancy loss occurs because of impaired uterine distension or implantation on a septum with decreased vascularity. Intrauterine growth restriction may occur secondary to abnormal uterine blood flow, causing uteroplacental insufficiency or a small uterine cavity. Male presentation is thought to occur secondary to a decreased size of the uterine cavity. In addition, the decreased uterine size is also postulated to cause an increase in preterm labor. Retained placenta can occur when the placenta is partially trapped in an upper tapered section of a narrow uterine horn. And rarely, uterine rupture can occur from pregnancy in an obstructed or rudimentary horn. How do we diagnose malarian anomalies? Certainly, surgery can diagnose malarian anomalies, but imaging modalities such as hysterosalpingogram, hysteroscopy, and ultrasound are helpful and less invasive. However, these modalities can miss some anomalies, including in our patient. MRI is still considered the gold standard. This MRI image demonstrates a septate uterus. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on malarian anomalies. We have discussed the embryologic origins of the reproductive system, the role of the SRY gene, anti-malarian hormone, and testosterone on sexual differentiation, and the errors that result in malarian anomalies. Music